Okay, that's wonderful. So good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I hope uh, you are free from football because you are between two big competitions, I understand, in Wembley. But uh, we will go to another competition. This is a competition to live longer and, and better. And I, I want to share with you all my experience, but not only my experience, and Carol was right when she said that I will share my patient because science is, should be first patient. And that's what I want to share with you this afternoon. So I will share my screen, this is more uh, concrete. And uh, I will take a lot of example, a lot of photo uh, to show you really what it means living longer and living better in the blue zone and what we can do in our uh, so-called Western society. Let me share my screen with you. I suppose so. Are you, is it correct? Do you see my screen? I don't know. Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay, so let me see. Partager. So I put the, I do this and I click on this. Is it okay now? Yes, we can see it now. Ah, Brilliant. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So let's try to see first the, I'm there, so now I have to, see if my yeah so the world population is aging i will not tell you a very big news but uh, what is really important is that uh, people will live not only longer but better and healthier this is something that uh, we have to consider and this is the most important topic for you also we are mostly dealing with what i named individual longevity and individual longevity, this is a person in one place, a, another person, and these person are living longer. But the first point, and this is for a demographer, and this is part of my work, is the validation of age. Is it that the, that person is effectively 100? This is a very crucial point. And I will show you some example. Look, for example, this uh, grave. This is a grave where uh, mommy me, is uh, mentioned and it is said that she reached 125. So shall I say that she was uh, older than Jean Calmon? Not at all, because after some uh, research, I understand that this plate has been put on the grave when it was in 50 years of the death of the person. So it was that person died at 75 and 50 years later, they put this grave and put 125. You see, it's a bit amazing. But I have a better a example, you will see. You have to understand that uh, the accuracy of longevity is very, very important. You have a lot of uh, people around the world that are checking the age of centenarian. And most of the place where people are living longer has been in fact uh, invalidated. Look this, uh, a wonderful woman from Georgia in the Caucasus, Marta. This is her uh, passport in Russian. Uh, it, no, it's written in uh, Georgian and Russian at the same time. And you can see that on the left, she was born in 1891. And I visited her in 2002. So at that time, she was 110. Woo, wonderful. So I was so, so happy to see a super centenarian. But then we tried to find evidence on document. And the first document that we found is a house book from 1938. And on this house book, the family is there. And you can see on the, on the sheet there that she is in the second line. And she was born in 1901, which means 10 years later. Oh, ho. This is a bit disturbing for us. Let's go on, because every two years they put a new book. And look in the next book, it was not 1901, but 1900. Aha. And if you go to the next book, it will be 1895. And look, the last one, 1891. So this is a wonderful girl. She succeeded to age 20 years in only 10 years. This is a, a wonderful situation, but this is just to show you that age is very crucial. So that person was effectively, when I met her, 100. 
and not 120. And you know very well that there is a big difference, a large difference between a person 100 and 110. Another example is Antonio Todi. Antonio Todi was the oldest man on earth beginning of this century. And on this uh, birth record, I was a bit disturbed because you cannot read it on the screen, but I will say that he was said to be born from a mother that is not um, married, without name. So which means that you don't know the name of the mother. That was disturbing me a lot because then you cannot do a lot of check uh, on the family and so on. And hopefully we found in the church another document, a birth record, a baptism record. And in the baptism record, the name on the fourth line of Francesca Angela Diana is written, which means that you have really to look all the document and all should be consistent to be sure that the validation of age is full. Look, for example, the difficulty with Japanese document. You have a Japanese uh, birth record on the right, and you can see uh, how is it possible to distinguish all the part of the document with all the letter there. Uh, hopefully, I have a, a student that was uh, from Japan, and he helped me to understand these documents. And I don't tell you also that to have access to such document is a very, very long story. Let's see together some validated uh, centenarian or super centenarian. This is, for example, Virginia. And at the same time, I will show you some characteristics. For example, Virginia, who was 110, and you have two photos, 100 and 110. And she loves to drink beer. You know, we, love, uh, we, we, we drink a lot of beer in Belgium. Huh? You have also a sister. And sister Alberta, she pray all her life and she reached also 110. You have Louis, and Louis is a wonderful man. He was the oldest person in Belgium from Wallonia and a male that was really amazing at that time. And he, he was uh, smoking two pipes a day. So this is really, I will show you here. This is Louis, you will not hear. Huh? He was drinking. Drinking, we are drinking a, a small elixir. And it was from the the daughter, and this is from two centenarian from Costa Rica, and they are wonderful. But you will see Panchita on the right. Look, Panchita, she was one hundred and over, and she's able to cut the wood. Look this, and she was with a wonderful skirt and some jewels around the neck there. And she was about 100 and she died at 108. Some years ago. She's from, from Costa Rica. This is Juan Rio Davis. He reached 114 in Menorca. And he was the oldest man uh, in uh, Europe at that time. And look here, he was able to do for me a, a, an autograph and to sign at that time. The daughter is on the left. and. He was really wonderful. He did not believe in God and uh, and did not want to die. And so he reached 114. And the other way, uh, Dolores was also one of the And uh, she believed strongly in God and asked uh, God to bring hope to everything. This is Kamato on Kamatongo from Kagoshima. There was some problem in validation because she was supposed to be 116, and in fact, she was only probably 110. This is not a huge difference, but for a demographer, this is a very important difference. And look what I did. I suggest, uh, I bring her some Belgian chocolates. You see, maybe it was a, a, a gift for her, but a reason to live long. You see, this is Kamato Ongo, south of Japan, Kagoshima. Now we will, switch from individual longevity, which means a person alone who lives longer, to population longevity, where you have an area where people are living longer. So usually gerontologists are dealing with longevity starting at 90. We work mostly about on centenarian, but the main difference that I want to introduce here is the difference between individual longevity and population longevity. 
And to understand what it means by population longevity, uh, just to say that uh, for individual longevity, the age at death is the key variable. But for population longevity, you may have the life expectancy, you have the probability to reach 100, you have several index that are used and that may be, uh, that may be used to compare population between each other. Just to compare countries, you have here the probability to become centenarian in uh, several European Japanese country. And you can see that for female, the top 959, this is France, before Japan, 788, while England is 646. And this is for female. And for male, it's Japan 163, before France 140, and England is 85. And this is amazing to see how you have so big difference. For example, uh, England for, for uh, this, this uh, male is quite half compared to, to Japan. But don't worry, Belgium is even lower. So, and Finland is, is at the bottom. So you have a very huge difference in the probability to reach 100 from one country to the other one. In fact, in now there is, uh, a, it will be 50 years ago. This man that you see on the screen, Alexander Leaf, he traveled around the world and published an article in uh, National Geographic. And uh, he explained the three places of the world that he has visited and where he found extraordinary people that live so, so long. That was the Hunza, High Pakistan, that was Vilcabamba in Ecuador, and that was in Abkhazia in Caucasus. And he was very proud, and this, this, this paper in 73 was very famous. But in fact, some years ago, he has to admit that these people exaggerate their age. Why? Because when he visited again Vilcabamba, some people were suddenly 10 years older. And he understand that finally, uh, these population wanted to to increase their social status and even to, to promote the local tourism. And then the age are, were growing, growing and growing, and you can do nothing as demographer using these data. So at that moment, all the place of the world that were uh, longevity hotspot were not validated at all. So this is again the crucial point, validation. And for valid identifying a longevity island, this is the key point. And what happens is that in 99, so long time after LEAF, there was a meeting in Montpellier in France. And this meeting was a meeting of demographer. And a, a medical doctor from Sardinia arrived and explained that in Sardinia, there are in the mountain area a lot of centenarian and even a lot of male centenarian. The reaction of the audience was direct. We were all suspicious. And uh, the conclusion is that we have to go and do validation. And I was the only volunteer. So I arrived in Alguero, north of Sardinia, in January 2000. And I started with uh, uh, Gianni the, to go from one village to another village. And on the screen now you can see what is usually found in our country, a random distribution of centenarian. On the left, a low density of centenarian. On the right, a high density of centenarian. But in fact, in Sardinia, we have a difference. And that's what I explained to my colleagues. I say, we agree, all your centenarian are true. But this is not the main result. This is not the key point. The key point is that they are not randomly distributed. They are cluster. And you can see this cluster. And this cluster is very important. This is a longevity area. And what I did at that moment, I took a blue marker and I took a map of Sardinia. And on the map of Sardinia, I draw the blue zone, just because I have at that moment a blue marker. On the left side, you have the, the information that was available before, that the distribution of the centenarian that were surveyed by place of residence. On the right, this is by place of birth, and this is after uh, uh, smoothing uh, methods. So you can see directly that in one part of, the, of Sardinia, 
around uh, La Marmora, the highest mountain, you have a higher proportion of centenina. And this is the blue zone. And it has been finally defined as a, a rather limited homogeneous geographical area where the exceptional longevity has been fully validated. This is really important, has been proved to be exceptional and they are sharing a common lifestyle and the same environment, and that will be useful to study more in detail. This is the paper that has been published 2004, where for the first time I mentioned the term blue zone, and this is uh, the first appearance in the publication, but scientific publication of the term blue zone. Just to show you on the survival curve, this is male, in Villa Grande, the, the village that is the highest level of longevity in Sardinia, compared with Italy and Sweden. And you can see that uh, Sweden do better than Italy. This is the red compared to the yellow. And uh, for Villa Grande, the difference is very well seen after the age of 85 and 90. That you have definitely the impression that they don't die when they reach 80, 85. They live easily to 95 to 100. This is the space. The, the main uh, message that I found there, the main observation. And um, what happens at the same time is that uh, Dan Butner, uh, a journalist from the US, was also interested by a place of the world where people are living longer. And he published in November 2005 in National Geographic, uh, a paper dealing with the, the famous place of longevity. And he, he mentioned Okinawa, that was well known at that time, Sardinia, where we were working, and Loma Linda. And Loma Linda, these are a group of Adventists in uh, California. So this is effectively not a blue zone as such. And he mentioned in this paper the term blue zone for the first time. Nowadays, we have four blue zones around the world because in cooperation with Dan Butner, I found a blue zone in Greece, in Icaria. I found the blue zone in Costa Rica. So now we have four blue zones, as you can see on the map. And uh, I am still continuing to work. And I have a lot of candidates. For example, I have visited already twice Cuba. And there are a lot of possibilities to find people living longer in Cuba. Uh, the only problem is that I have no access to some data. And some data are really needed for a demographer to prove that these data are correct and the number of centenarians is higher. So I cannot say anything about on CUDA nowadays. I am also done some work on Barbados, on Mauritius, on Caucasus. I have visited Malta. I visited really a lot of countries around the world. And the first thing that I'm always doing when I visit a new country and a new village is to go and visit the cemetery and to see if there are some age that are exceptional. If you go to Villa Grande, a village of 3,000 inhabitants, they, I have counted up to now 47 centenarians. Can you imagine this? If you compare with the situation in your country or in my country, it may be that we have the chance to have one centenarian. In this village, 47. And if you go in the cemetery, it's easy to find grave with centenarian. I think I counted 35. So this is really a crazy situation, amazing situation. And uh, I was very, very astonished. And I'm going on. I may say that I hope very soon to come back with a new blue zone. That will be the news in the forecoming months, if all is OK. And what is good is to say that uh, this blue zone it is not the end of the story, because uh, what we have to do is to try to see what is the lesson that we may take from this blue zone. And Dan Butner was one of the first ones that tried to disseminate the lesson of the blue zone in the US. And he did this, uh, I, know, I will show it later. He did a project that I will show you later. But first, I want to show you the factor that we observe on the field that can be characteristic from the ex exceptional longevity population. These population have some character, some characteristic, and I want to show you these. I will use a lot of photo because I think that the photo may tell you more than the long text on the screen. So just to say that 
when you study a blue zone, you have a higher chance to find the factor that favor longevity. Why? Because these people are born and live in the same location. They share the same genetic background makeup. They have the same early life condition and they have the same traditional, uh, I would say, lifestyle. So if some of these may be uh, found, it is they are one of the factors that are explaining longevity. Let's try to see. You, you can see on the screen some uh, some explanation, some factor that may be beyond genetics, environment, social, cultural, occupation, lifestyle, and below stochasticity. So we have to try to see what is the part of this stochasticity compared to diet, physical activity, environment, and so on. It is not yet easy, and as you will understand, it is a full interdisciplinary approach that you need to have. If you work only on the side of genetics, you miss a large part. If you work only on physical activity, you miss also. You have to try to put all the factors together, what is not, not easy at all. Uh, just to take an example, this is some explanation that has been proposed to reach longevity. Why the genetic isolation of these population is favoring some genes, why uh, you have uh, more organic food, and why you have more energy expenditure, and all this is going to uh, some uh, disease that are really de decreasing in number, and then to longevity. So these are all our theory, all what we try to, to prove when you go on the blue zone. Let's see now some photo to, 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 to understand really what is the life in the blue zone and what might be these factor uh, supporting longevity. Look, Antonio here, he is really living simply. I will not tell you that the sofa where he is sitting is very soft. No, it's a piece of wood. It's only in appearance that you have some, some soft area there. This is Antonio. And he's not living alone. Yes, he's living alone there, but the sis, the daughter is living just nearby. That's something important for him. This is another story. In Sardinia, the key of the house are not inside, but outside. You may enter as you want. This is something that is disturbing us. Why we have so many keys? They have also key in this place, but they put it outside. Please enter, you are at home. This is a really modern kitchen. This is the, the kitchen in Costa Rica, yeah? you, if you like it. And just to say that most of these population experience uh, caloric restriction in their life, and all of them will tell you that you have to stop eating when your stomach is 80% uh, full. This is something that we, we understood very in all the different blue zones. And I will say that there is no specific uh, food that may explain one longevity. I will not say this is olive oil, this is fish, this is... Uh, I don't know. There is a lot of theory telling that chocolate is very good to live longer. Um, I don't know which which type of food, which type of fruit. Here you have the, the Goya on the right. This is supposed to be contributing to longevity in Okinawa. And the red pasta, red pepper pasta in Korea in the, in the, on the left. These are two supposed uh, food for living longer. And uh, what is clear is that all this population has a lot of local fruit and vegetable. And this is on the market in, in Costa Rica. And what I was very disturbed is when I visited Barbados and I saw this garlic coming in Barbados from China. Can you imagine? It's really amazing. This is again a market in Costa Rica and it is very important that what you eat is locally produced and to avoid processed food. These are factors that are really important for longevity. They are fruit that are really produced in the, the area and they are really in agreement with you, with your body and so on. Now, Salvatore Angelo, he died at 102 and you can see that he eats something very, very limited. You have some goat cheese, local goat cheese, with a glass of red wine. And this is the evening meal. And it is in Seulo, in Sardinia. And Nanette 103 ate only potato with some basilic on the top and some herbs, rosemary, and uh, some cheese. This is uh, 
both die for sure already today. They are already not anymore there, but they were really living simply and eating very uh, wisely. This is now moving naturally. This man was coming from the forest with wood and he was 95 on the donkey. I was afraid that he will fall from the donkey, but he, he was very terrific. And look, this end. It is somebody who rolled cigar in Cuba more than half century. He was 100 and he rolled Cuba, uh, this cigar in Cuba. This is a cowboy. I have to wake up at six in the morning to go and he is doing this lasso and he was 92. And the same person in 102 just recently still on the horse. So it's amazing and he's still alive. Don Pachito is still alive. And Johan Rudavez that you saw before signing this autograph was still biking in the village at 100. Can he, we may, maybe we may engage him for the next Tour de France, you see. And uh, this is my friend uh, on the right. And my friend uh, Gianni was 54 and he was trying to do this exercise with a Dicarian and he lost. He was not able. They are so strong. I have never seen end of, uh, of people like the one of these Icarian. It's amazing. Religiosity is a very important factor for longevity. And uh, look, this is uh, somebody from Caucasus. He is praying there in a very simple uh, way. And in Icaria, something very special on the grave. You can see the sign of the communism at the same time at the cross and they are celebrating the 1st of May. This is the, the island where the communists uh, from Athens were exiled after the, the revolution in the 70s. But they go end to end, which means that you have uh, a common meal for all the village every year in all village, and you have not to pay everything. Everybody eat the same thing and is participating. I, have, I was in such of this uh, meal. It's a wonderful area, wonderful place. Now I want to tell you the true story of Felipe Godoy Godoy. In fact, I was in Costa Rica with uh, Dan Butner and National Geographic, and they wanted to do a, a reportage, a, 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 a small film of, on this guy, because he was supposed to be 108. And he was wonderful. You can see here, there is uh, this special uh, instrument to, 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 like, uh, to, to fight against animal and uh, this photography has been published in all the National Geographic. But in fact, I did not succeed to validate his age because he did not have ID. And when finally we found his ID, he was only 98. And uh, for sure, Dan, Dan Butner was very disappointed because it's a big difference between a paper on somebody 98 or a, a person that is 101, 108. And so he was only for one page in National Geographic. But I want to show you really what is amazing, because when I visit these people, I go always around. And so I went in his sleeping room and uh, I have side to side a pinup and the last scenery. This is really a paradox. And this is my best friend, Felipe Godoy Godoy. There are a lot of uh, intergenerational relationship. Look, the grandmother and the daughter. Look here. This is just the 100th birthday of the person on the right and congratulating with the family member. This is somebody in nursing home, also being well surrounded. This is in Costa Rica. And I like really this photography because this is a couple. This is largely above 80 in Costa Rica. They don't have a lot of things, but they seem and they are really happy. Just to say that they live in this country very naturally. And for example, on this graph, I try to show on the right and on the left the time spent when the sun is not there. So some of them wake up just before the sun will arrive and some of them, very few, uh, are still alive after 7 p.m. when the sun disappears but they, they are really alive and, and active all during the day. So they follow really 
the, the sun, and that's something that we understand really. And another thing also, and this is from Costa Rica, there is a strong prevention uh, for health service. You have free access to health service in both Costa Rica and in Cuba, for example. And not only uh, a free access, but also a visit of the nurse every month at home to see how you are going and how is so you are never alone in these uh, area of the world we try to compare and this is a paper that will be published uh, quite soon in mechanism uh, and so on and it will be the comparison between nonagenarian in sardinia and greece with the blue zone so the rest of the country and uh, what we found is that uh, in the blue zone there is a larger proportion of nonagenarian that are currently married. And in fact, it is well known that living and being married and living with spouse is a positively associated with living, living longer, especially for men. This is something not to forget. And optimism is also something that we found in this area and the perception to be optimist, but also the well-being and longevity. There is also a strong association between optimism and longevity. And uh, I will say that the, the, the self-rated health show higher score in uh, Sardinia and Icaria for both agenda and against these uh, people. So they, they fear really, but it may be linked to their optimism. So there is a, a relation for sure between, between the two. Oddly, it is seen that, uh, in, for example, in Icaria, a lot of men are smoking. That's something. And I will say also drinking wine. So, OK, I have no conclusion, but uh, maybe the, the tobacco is better there or they have some genes that preserve them better. You have also, we try also to check if there are some genetic difference between for some marker like APOE and FOX3, but we did not find very strong evidence for these populations. In fact, it may be that these genetic factor should be uh, taken into consideration in relationship with the environment and the psychological aspect. So it's not uh, alone that you have to look the the market, the genetic market. We, I think that for further investigation, age epigenetics is really important. And for example, the analysis of the microbiome and a lot of uh, investigation that tried to see uh, the, the situation on the side of the genetics, but in direct relationship with the environment and the lifestyle of these persons. So this is the future, but for sure, there is a lot of work to do and a lot of analysis, and this is not the easiest nowadays. Just, it's clear that to do this, you need a closer cooperation between disciplines. Nobody has the explanation. Nobody can say, I know why these people are living longer. They eat more fish. No, not at all. You have to manage a lot of variable and everybody knows in science that you are strong in your discipline, but you don't want to go and open the door of another discipline. As demographer, I am, I am ready to, to work with genetician, with medical doctor, with uh, anthropologists, with sociologists, but it's really not easy. We have to go, do really an effort of multi-generational, multi uh, multi-disciplinary uh, approach. And uh, the last story, and it is for me very important, is that this uh, blue zone, it is not, I will say, the place, I will say, you will go if you want to live longer, please, go and as shepherd in the mountain of Sardinia. I will say directly, no. What we have to now is to try to understand how we can disseminate the mind of the blue zone in our society, because we want to make better our uh, society in, and to live longer and to live in better health. And this is the main uh, story. Expanding the blue zone. There was already an article in 2008 from an American explaining that blue zones are not limited to a few population, but they should become commonplace. And uh, this is project, a project that has been done in the US by Dan Butner and his team to 
try to transfer the lesson of the Blue Zone at local level. I attended some meeting nearby Los Angeles where people coming from the municipality, from the normal citizen, they were discussing together what can we do to improve the situation in our village, in our city. And not to say you have to eat better, you have to do this. No, just to propose some way that will uh, do that spontaneously people will eat better. Spontaneously people will do some uh, more exercise. So it is not a direct message, it's an indirect to create an environment that will favor the longevity of people. This is the main objective of this uh, project. We have full meeting uh, about blue zone science and the, this one was in Loma Linda in, uh, in California. We have one in Aten also in on longevity and we have one in Costa Rica. And just to give an example on the photo there in Costa Rica, you have two prime ministers that were attending the, the meeting. It was very, very important because uh, they want really to to, to promote this uh, Zona Azul de Latin America. It was, and they are going on, but uh, sometimes when I see how things are changing in this area, I'm not so convinced that it will go on so, so long. We have to wait. In the Netherlands, you have a lot of development of Blue Zone that started in 2017. Man Made Blue Zone. That was a seminar that I gave in Groningen and the university is dealing with this. There is a neighborhood in Utrecht that is really trying to do in the line of the blue zone. This is the first urban blue zone neighborhood. There is in Flanders uh, a, a, a person that is de developing uh, houses and a neighborhood blue zone Flanders. And what is important is that he explain, and this is for me something important, help us change the world one blue zone at a time. But he say that by 2040, rest home will no longer exist. It is evident that the way we have our rest home or nursing home cannot survive in the future. We have in the south of Belgium, all a village that will be a, a village where all the generation will be together. It's a village where the old people will not be lost and so on. It is a village where you have this uh, parable in the past parable to collect the information, communication from the sky. And that was why they named it the Jardin des Parables, the, the garden of the parable. It is ongoing and I hope it will be effective in a few years. And they have the seven pillars of Blue Zone and I will re revise you these with you. So the first one is move naturally. The second one, eat wisely. The third one, relax avoid stress and ensure enough quality sleep. Family and close relationship are essential. Strong community support based on conviviality and mutual respect, the respect of the planet and purpose of life and religiosity. These are the seven pillars of the blue zone. And I will say that there are three words that I never heard in this area. These are leisure, hobby and fitness. They just live longer and simply alongside all days. And I just want to mention this positive aging and the zero transcendence. This is a theory that has been introduced by a Swedish researcher at the end of the last century. And I think it's uh, really important. I, I feel that these oldest old change fully their attitude and on a very positive way. And look what my good friends James Stewart said when I visited him already two years ago, the Lord has been so good for me. I am so, so grateful for the life. I am tremendously well. This is James Stewart. So please go at home with this message. First, it's important that you have not to go to the mountain of Sardinia to live longer and better. We have really to listen from the blue zone. They might be guidelines for our postmodern society. They are me really important. The second message is that you cannot exclude the old people from the society. It's more and more like this nowadays. And essentially in some rural area, old people are more and more living alone and lost. 
but also in major city. And the third one is that we have to keep our senior involved in the society. One of my uh, one of my intention is to say let's reintegrate the senior in our uh, society. Please look Ikaria. This is a boat looking the ocean. I like this photography. And Ikaria is the island where people take times for everything. Even they take times to die. That's why they live longer. And I finish with my good friend Antonio Tode. He was really a wonderful man. I tell him, I tell to the, the, the TV and so on all around the world that he was the oldest man on earth in 2002. And I stay with him and in end during some hours. He was very nice person. And look how he look at you. And this is why I want to finish my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, so, you much, so much, Michelle. Michelle. Absolutely fascinating. Um, I've, I've already got some hands up and there's quite a lot of co comments and questions uh, in the chat. Uh, if people would like to either put their question in the chat or put their, their hand up. Um, Sheila, your, your hand's already up if you would like to come in and ask your question. If you can unmute, Sheila. No, we'll go on to um, to Jean, Jean Katz, who's also got the hand up. If you if you can if you've got your hand up, if you can be ready to um, unmute. Uh, but I'll go back to some of the questions while while you're doing that uh from the uh from the chat so the first thing that comes up is a comment that retirement is not good for you uh and really asking whether you would agree that retirement is not a good idea michelle yes yeah so so one of the comments is that uh perhaps a, a question really as to whether retirement is a good idea or not uh, based on your experience of these uh, these people with with the the sort of the longevity, uh, I don't understand very clearly your question. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. So so the the question the question is uh, so somebody has commented that retirement sucks. Retirement is not good, and, uh, and yes, good work is good. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, my suggestion is definitely not to make this retirement age fix. This is something really uh, disturbing and uh, we have a significant number of persons who will die because they are obliged to retire at 65 or 67 and have nothing to do after and has to change their life. So for me, the, the time of retirement is really depending on what you are doing, what kind of job you are doing. I have seen in the blue zone, people are working up to 85 strongly up to 95 in their in their garden. I have seen a shepherd running in front of me in the in the mountain. He was 84. I was not able to follow him. So uh, being active as long as possible, as long as you can be really active, it's really important. And a, a very sudden retirement, it's really negative for your health. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. The, the next question from somebody is uh, around your comments on religiosity um, and they've asked whether could it be political beliefs or, or have you found that it's mainly religious beliefs or ideologies? OK, this is a very um, interesting point and that's why at one moment I show you two slides from Spain because in the same uh, trip I visited Joan Rudavest that was definitively agnostic. He did not believe and he did not want to die because he did, he did not want to. to he don't know what is after. Why the, uh, the, the women that we saw the, the day after was really a person that was expecting to die every day. And uh, her, her daughter was a sister in Latin America. And so, so 
I will say that most of the oldest old in the blue zone are religious people, definitely. But it is a religion not as we understand today. It's really different, really different. It, it is very in, in, in depth in their, in their brain, in their behavior, and they don't ask themselves so many questions as we do today. That's my, my feeling. Okay, thank you. She Sheila, so can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear oh, you now. I'm sorry, that's a, a very interesting talk, Mr. Poulin. I was interested in the fact that many of the Blue Zone places are islands. And I wondered whether there was anything about island living at a low population density compared to the island of, of Great of the UK. Um, and also Hmm. Something about the physical environment and islands. <laughs> I don't know. Obviously, you have um, you have a blue zone in in California, so that begs the difference. But there we are. <laughs> yes, yes. But in fact, the blue zone in California, it is just a selection beca because they are all advantaged. And you know that the Adventists does not work during the weekend. They don't eat meat, and there's a lot of uh, strong rules. So I will say it's an artificial blue zone. I, I name it a blue population. It's a blue population, but not a blue zone. At the other point, uh, you can see that the four blue zones are in a temperate uh, weather uh, climate. You see, it is a place where you have a, a lot of possibility to grow vegetable and so on. You know that in Europe, in the past, the, the best for longevity were the Nordic country, Sweden, Iceland and so on. But nowadays it is France, Spain, Italy and, and, and Greece, which means that uh, as in these countries, the, the weather, the climate is better and they are more uh, available fruit and, and vegetable and a lot of things. Uh, it seemed that uh, they were not a lot reaching old age before, because of health problem and health service and so on. But nowadays that they have health service everywhere, they can be the first one on, on the list uh, in terms of uh, longevity. And the fact that it is island, you know that island or mountain, let's say island or mountain, island and mountain uh, will preserve the traditional way of living. They will preserve a lot of uh, I would say the richness of the relationship in the village. You have seen the key is outside of the door. You have a lot of uh, celebration, a lot of support. You know that in Villa Grande, nobody is in nursing home. Nobody. There is no, never somebody sent in nursing home. Uh, this is something that is more visible in traditional. The, our urbanization did a lot of trouble in our society to put people uh, very crowded in city it okay at one moment it say it, it is said that it brings more easily to health service but it brings also a lot of negative uh, point these people live quietly naturally and uh, i will say that uh, what can we do i don't know we will not return to the countryside we will not return to to, to do our garden and so on but we have to try to see what we can do. And that's the main wish of uh, these uh, new village that we want to introduce in Belgium or new neighborhood where you will have garden, common garden. Uh, you will have the place to, to walk. You will, have, you will be close to the nature and you will have even the place to welcome your children and grandchildren. They can live there with you during the weekend. You have a lot of things. Uh, it's not well supported, but I think it's the future. I will I will I will promise you in 20 years the nursing home as you uh, we have nowadays should disappear. This is not the way. This is not the future. We right. have to change something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Sheila. Um, Dana, do you want to come in with your question? Dana Rosenfeld, are you are you there? Hello, hi. Uh, I am I here? Am I here? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you now. Yeah. Oh, hello, hi, hi. Bonjour, Monsieur. Thank you very much for that. That was really amazing, and I'm just so delighted to have been able to to hear it. Um, 
what I'd like to say is this, and I'm I'm approaching this as a sociologist. OK, so that's my uh, rather than a demographer, but I want to just make a suggestion here based upon the sort of research that I have done. I want to suggest that intergenerational solidarity, which you recognized as a, a very, very important factor here, is actually shorthand for an egalitarianism that might span beyond individual families. And I'm sure you know about uh, Wilkinson's work on the deleterious effect of hierarchical societies and communities that hierarchy itself is obviously replicated by other people, Sapolsky and Marmot. Hierarchy as is an independent factor that causes stress, which and the stress expresses itself in a range of diseases and other poor outcomes, suicidality, accident, homicide, everything. So hierarchy here is an independent variable for stress, poor health and premature mortality. And I wonder whether given that, if we do accept that, which some people don't, because it's politically a very, very dangerous thing, but I accept it. Um, that is it is it not naive to think that we can replicate some of the factors, some of the cultural factors within isolated communities within, right, and take those and import them into capitalist, oppressive, globalized societies where hierarchy is the norm, not only the norm, but perhaps the national we're looking at the same outcomes. So I'm wondering whether whether we can we, we're just sort of setting up these sort of romanticized, small, isolated villages that would not have the same outcomes because people will be living in them with the lifelong consequences of this hierarchy, which is still operative outside of those walls. So I wonder what you have to say about that, which I say totally respectfully, by the way, with great respect. No, no, I, I fully agree with you. Our our society is uh, fully in the competition. We are competing between each other. And uh, I will say that, and we have also to compete with the, the food industry. How can you find easily something from your garden? And even some garden are not even protected from outside and so on. So in this country, I will say that the, the money is, is even not needed. Uh, this Antonio that I show you in the first slide, he does not need any money. What he will do with money? This is not our 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 world is is fully uh, under the, the, the story of money, profit and so on. And uh, but what can we do? I think the, the only thing to do is to try to promote these places where uh, the way of living will be different and hoping that it will spread, that there will be more and more. And that's what we are observing in the Netherlands and in Belgium. I am really involved. For example, in the Netherlands, I am involved in a network improving the quality of life in work. This is named Vitalität. And I have a lot of uh, conference with the biggest uh, company in the Netherlands to reconciliate the family life with the work life. This is essential. You cannot consider that the work life is something that you do outside. You know that the world is divided in two. Half of the people are dreaming during the week what they will do during the weekend, and the other half are during uh, dreaming during the weekend what they will do during the week. We have to reconcile the two and to bring our family in the in the in the company in the industry and so on and so on. There is a lot of change, and I saw a partner in the Netherlands that are really, really interested. And I did a lot of keynote in the Netherlands and I will continue to do this. You know, Blue Zone is not only something crazy that I found 20 years ago. It is something that is needed for our society and mostly after the COVID, in this post-COVID area. This is crucial. And I at, will be- at, at, at all ages. Exactly, exactly. At all ages. Yeah, exactly. And I will I will push again on the bottom very soon, bringing new blue zone and coming with a very strong uh, indication on what we have to do for future. I think it's essential. Thank you. Merci Thank you very much, both of you. Um, Christine, do you want to come in and ask your question? Thanks very much for that, Carol. Um, Michelle, I find that fascinating. I just wanted to pick up on one of the points that you were stressing, and I'm sure people will have others too, but it was about this issue of the importance of religiosity. Um, and I just, I was 
as you were talking about it, I was reflecting back and thinking, but you could make exactly the opposite claim for those many countries in which religious persecution is actually shortening people's lives, where there are, you know, so many wars and, 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 and various other things. So I wondered whether it was more about spirituality than religiosity and, and whether you could just kind of respond to that. I agree fully with you. These people are just considering that there is somebody or someone above them. OK, and they want to take care of those who live with them, because uh, the main message of the so-called religion is that you have to take care of those who are with you, living with you. And, respect them. and that's what we are not, that's not what we are not doing anymore in our society. Uh, if, if you have to protect yourself from all your uh, forbidden and so on, this is crazy, crazy. Let's say spirituality, OK? but also taking care of the others. This is um, supporting each other. This is for me the most important. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions from people who'd like to put their hand up? I think I think we're, we're finished with the questions now. There's, there's a really interesting chat. I'll copy it and send it to you, Michelle, so you can see some of the discussion that's been going on in that's the it. chat as well. Thank uh, you. If I've missed anything, can anybody would like to chip in? Now's your chance. But lots of lots of uh, comments and, and thanks uh, to, to you in terms of your um, your presentation. Uh, so just I'm just looking quickly at the chat. Um, just make sure there's nothing else before we finish. So Bruce is just as, as, a, as a last question is, is said how much uh, religiosity or spirituality correlates with other factors that you mentioned like optimism um, and self-rated health. It goes, it goes definitely in the same direction. For me it's it's really end in end. You, you cannot uh, do the difference. Uh, if if you present me somebody who say that he is religious and, and pessimist, I will say there is something problematic. <laughs> yeah. And hey, Hayley, do you want to come in? You've just put your hand up. Yeah, please. Um, thanks so much, Carol. Uh, Michelle, that's amazing, amazing, amazing talk. So inspiring. Yeah. Um, I have a, a, a potentially very silly question um, and pardon my terrible geography on this, but I was struck by the possibility that a lot of the all of the blue zones that you've looked at are very high above sea level. Um, is that right? Or have I have I got that completely wrong? And is that something I know that you did mention that you were looking at environment as uh, as as one of the factors? So it's just yeah, just a question about whether being high above sea level has anything to do with it. It is clear that uh, in a village where you have to do a lot of effort to do and just to visit your neighbor and you have to climb for 20 or 30 meters. So you do more physical exercise and you move naturally. This is something crucial. And uh, the climate is also a factor. But just to say that I tried to find longevity in Denmark and uh, and in some valley of Norway where the, the climate is not so, so wonderful. I found really uh, a woman 108 in a, in a valley of uh, Norway and it was really amazing. So it is possible. Can you imagine that in the north of Europe, these people who reached 100 there ate only potato, carrot and some sauerkraut during years and years and they reached 100. So why to go and try to find some exotic fruit from all over the world and to pay a lot of carbon uh, <laughs> to bring them to you? Please eat tomato during the right season. Eat what you produce in your garden and then you will be the most healthy of the world. You're giving me hope for being in Lancaster. Uh, a, a mere, a, a baby 39. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like Lancaster actually is a great place for lots of sort of opportunities for joint growing of organic vegetables. It's quite a thing in Lancaster. I hope, um, I hope to have the possibility to visit you in Lancaster. I was expecting and to go a bit um, north to the Adrian Wall there, 
and there yes. is somewhere nearby the Lake District, I think. It's and beautiful, yeah. I have, I have done, I have been attracted for orienteering there in the Lake District. I will be well, there. The, the invitation is open, Michelle. Thank okay. you so much for such a, a great, uh, a great session. Uh, somebody has put up, said they have a question. So is that Dana again? Sorry, I thought you had just hadn't put you. Hi, hi. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's Donna actually, but. Sorry. That's quite all right. That's all right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to dominate, but but um, Monsieur Poulain, um, uh, something that occurred to me. Um, sometimes problems with problems are actually data, and I'm wondering. I noted it, when you began your 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 incredible talk, talking about issues of validation, how a lot of people exaggerate their ages, which I can understand can sometimes happen. Um, but you mentioned that that perhaps one of the reasons is status that claiming to be or being seen as being 108, 110 in certain contexts could actually be valuable, culturally valuable, symbolically valuable, and that might be one of the reasons why people exaggerate their ages. And I'm wondering whether there might be a potential overlap, because obviously, have you looked at ageism as a potential variable here? Because I, I'm imagining, I'm hypothesizing here, um, that if you're living in a society in which age is not is seen as a value, perhaps certainly late later life is seen as a value. That that signifies something. That signifies a symbolic cultural system of social valuation that encourages people to be. You know, when when you have a society that incur that 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 values certain social statuses, we want those social statuses, right? We work, we work, we invest in actually achieving them, and perhaps that could be. And and of course. If you're in a society which which values older later life, even though people can't aren't necessarily as productive in terms of reproduction and things as beforehand, then that obviously signifies a very interesting um, social and communal identity and effort and investment that itself is part of a larger a larger commitment to its population. So I'm just wondering whether you looked at that at the valuation of age and the and the and the. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm. I'm no, no, the role of age is terrific because, uh, for example, in Sardinia, the oldest old are participating in all the the meal, even if they say nothing. They some suddenly uh, fall sleeping, but they are there. And just I mentioned also another point. You know where why Caucasus was mentioned as a longevity area. Just because Stalin was born there, and he wanted to prove that the place where he was born is a long-living area. And but I I found some centenarian in Caucasus, but not so many. And what I want to find is place where you have a high proportion of centenarian, because then you have really a secret to go through. And the role of age is, is crucial. But as I and I come back on this, interdisciplinary approach is fundamental. We have to discuss, and the the answer is in the mind of centenarian. They have in their mind all the discipline inside, and all is included. And if you don't talk, if you don't go on the field, if you don't talk with them, you will never understand what is longevity. So I want really to push all of you to visit, to talk with all the centenarian around the world. They will tell you all their secret, and it's so wonderful. Excellent. I think on that note, we, we'll end. There's, there's some lovely comments in the chat. There's people who um, your your work has inspired to become gerontologists, Michelle. So um, you're, you're clearly doing doing a great job in terms of inspiring people as well as uh, following your own passion as well. So thank you so much. I just encourage everybody to carry on. There's a break now. Uh, and following that, there's a poster session with a lot of our earlier careers, uh, um, career researchers, uh, another parallel session, and then later this evening we have a, a bit of a party. Um, okay, so uh, if, maybe if people want to just put their camera on and their sound on and we can do a proper live applause rather than with the yellow hands. <laughs> And very soon I will see you. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks. thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.